Welcome to the Lou Catino Show, where we can learn to reimagine our lifestyle. Dan, it's a pleasure to have you on our show. You've been top 10 in India for I don't know how long ever <laughs> since you released the show. And, you know, I just want to say that personally, I mean, in my field of integrative and lifestyle medicine, you know, it's research-based. And there's always so many ways to look at research. But the way you brought out your research, which we can see you've spent years on that, is just fabulous and spectacular. So thank you for that, because as we speak, you're changing lives. We have our own patients watching your show and coming back to us and saying, hey, Luke, can we get some more beans in our plan? You know, Luke, <laughs> family connection, I'm divorced, I'm lonely. It's important for us. So it's it's high impact. And I wanted to start off with what's your ikigai, Dan? What's your ikigai, you know, at this point in your life? I've actually thought a lot about it, which of course means your sense of purpose or the reason, reason you wake up in the morning. And for the past 30 years, I've been clear that what I'm good at is going out into the world, exploring traditional peoples, understanding their wisdom and bringing their wisdom back. You know, and, and in a way, it's my own sort of version of a hero's journey. And uh, it's what I love to do. And um, it's become a job. I, I feel very blessed. Yeah, I see your expressions in uh, each of the blue zones that you've been in. And it's like, you're like this little, little child surrounded <laughs> by people, making them laugh and creating this fabulous conversation with them. Your two bestsellers, New York bestsellers. I would love for you to talk about, you know, you know, what got you to write these two books? You have a show on Netflix and you have two bestsellers. And I love the cookery. I, I love the cookbook because it gives us ideas on how to put these amazing ingredients that are connected with longevity together. But I would love for you to talk about your two books, please. Well, at, at the end of the day, I'm a writer for National Geographic. Unlike other writers, uh, I kind of create the story as well as just cover it. So this, this whole Blue Zones idea was it to, in a sense, reverse engineer longevity. Instead of looking for secrets to living longer in a Petri dish or a test tube, uh, we found populations who've achieved the outcomes we want, which is to live a long time, largely without chronic disease. And then after finding five of those, I, I, we, we sought uh, to, to identify the common denominators or the, or, or the correlates. And uh, I've written a couple cover stories for National Geographic magazine. And then a book, The Blue Zones Kitchen, which takes this diet of longevity, makes it easy to put to work in your home. And my latest book, uh, called The Secrets of Long Life is meant to be a manual that um, captures the way these populations have actually lived and gives you a step-by-step -step prescriptive of how to put it to work in your life. And remember, I'm not, um, I'm not picking out individual nutrients or recommending pharmaceuticals. Uh, these are the practices and more importantly, the environmental tweaks, the way you set up your surroundings that have driven entire populations of people to an extra decade of good life. Great, Dan. What I like about your work is you've got research, you've got solid research, you have science, and a lot of your research coming out from people who are those role models. Do you face challenges? I want to understand because when you go on Instagram, there's this whole overlook on people saying that meat is the best. And we're not here to make a decision, but I want to figure out from you, how do you manage this? How do you manage all of these, you know, claims coming in? Yeah. I ignore them. <laughs> I'm confident in my own work. You know, I work for National Geographic. The, the fact checkers occupy the corner offices. So when some half-cocked uh, demographer uh, looks at one erroneous facet of my work or uh, erroneously looks at a facet of my work and comes out with these proclamations, uh, I realize you can't do too much about it. But we were very careful. You know, we spent two years at least to make sure – People's ages were what they really said they were, because a lot of places you get age um, uh, exaggeration or people really don't know their age. We work with demographers and work very hard to check birth certificates and baptismal certificates. And also, you know, that where I get most criticisms, you know, if you look at the traditional diet of people in the blue zone, 
for so if you want to know what a hundred year old ate to live to be a hundred, you have to know what they were eating when they were a little kid and when they were a young adult and newly retired. You can't just look at what they're eating today. So somebody who goes to Sardinia today, which is one of our blue zones, or or uh, Costa Rica, you'll see them eating a lot of meat, and you'll draw the conclusion: Oh my God, they eat a ton of meat. But if you look at over time, about ninety to ninety five percent of what they were eating were things like whole grains and vegetables from their gardens and tubers like sweet potatoes and beans. Beans were the cornerstone of every longevity diet in the world. So my books, you know, actually did a meta analysis. They found 155 dietary surveys done in all five blue zones uh, over the past hundred years to see what people were actually eating. We did it under the ages of Harvard. So uh, people who have a, a meat agenda, uh, there's some, uh, and there's several of them who like the taste of meat and they, they think it's a, almost a religion to, to eat it. Um, they, some, they come after me, but they don't, they don't, they're half cocked. They're not, um, they're, they, they're cherry picking, uh, studies that support their point of view and ignore the 90% that don't support their point of view. So, at first, I got kind of per personally hurt by it. Now I just stopped reading them. Yeah. No, I think that kind of makes sense. Just ignore them because, you know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff today. It's gone almost three grams of meat protein per kilo of your body weight. And the whole principle that they use is the caveman. But people back then didn't even have that much of food to eat. They had the whole That's right. feast. So, yeah, I get what you're saying. But, you know, in India, a lot of people, a lot of people a vegetarian. And I think I think what the work that you've done is just reinforced, you know, some amount of safety in our vegetarian population in India, that they're on the right track, because a lot of people in our culture prefers to kind of, you know, follow what the West is always saying. And they feel that, hey, I've been vegetarian for religious beliefs. And now do I really need meat? Or am I going to get cancer if I don't eat meat? Am I going to have all these problems? And then you come with beans and everything that you picked up, picked up on nutrition, which is pretty much standard in India as well. So Dan, you know, we have four pillars of integrative and lifestyle medicine. There is nutrition, cellular, exercise, sleep, and emotional wellness. So I know we have you for limited time today. So I'm going to deep dive straight into these four pillars for all of our audience. If we take nutrition first, what are your top three points of advice that you would give us based on all your research? We're going to get your book as well and put it up as well for people to get into it in detail. But yeah, if you had the whole of India watching you right now, we're talking about nutrition. What would your advice be to everyone when it comes to your experience on nutrition? and Well, for, I wouldn't say this in every continent, but for India, I would say pay attention to what your grandparents ate because they probably had it right on. So uh, eating a whole food, plant-based diet, 90 to if you celebratory once in a while, you eat some meat, there's not a problem. Stay away from processed food. Uh, and the biggest thing is to make sure you uh, learn how to cook at home. Uh, at least in America, every time you go out to eat, you consume up to 300 more calories. They tend to be more laden with fat and sodium and added sugars. Learning how to cook at home is, if you're not doing it already, you probably are. You're absolutely right. In other words, I, I think India could teach most of the world how to eat instead of the other way around. Thanks for that piece of advice. Something that came out in the Blue Zones also was people sit together as families and they eat. Is this the emotional connect of being happy while you're eating and the digestion of food? Yeah. The, the thing is, if you're eating on the run, you're, you're far more likely to be eating fast food or junk food. If you eat with a family, there tends to, you tend to slow down, make it more likely you'll have you'll, the fullness signal will reach your brain before you overeat. Um, there's been several studies done in the United States that show when families eat together, the the the, the content is much more nutritional. Uh, they the kids drink less sodas, less junk food. So yes, a family. And by the way, if there's not conscious efforts to keep the family together, they start to drift apart. And we know from Blue Zones research that investing in your family, keeping aging parents nearby invest in your spouse and, and really invest in your children is probably worth four to six extra years of life expectancy over trying to go it alone or, or letting your family disintegrate. Wow. Yeah. Thanks for that. I liked how you spoke 
about the importance of, you know, keeping your family, your parents closer to you. It's good for their health as well as our own health. So when it comes and to- And your children's. Our children, yeah. What about exercise? Now, I know you spoke about most of these people just have primal moves. They walk, they climb hills, they squat down like an Okinawa. And yeah, can you add to that, please, your research on the exercise part? Yeah. Well, exercise, you know, my daytime job is I get hired by insurance companies to lower the obesity rates of cities. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the data, exercise is really good business, but it's terrible public health uh, strategy. Uh, in America, anywhere, fewer than 24% of people get even 20 minutes of physical activity a day. In other words, we think we're exercising, but we're not. Uh, in blue zones, people are taking probably eight to 10,000 steps every day without even thinking about it. Every time they go to work or a friend's house or out to eat, it, it's occasions a walk. M much of the time that walk is uphill too, by the way. They have gardens out back. So they're spending an hour or so every day weeding and, and hoeing and, and, and uh, watering and harvesting. And their houses aren't full of mechanical conveniences. So they're doing their yard work by hand and their kitchen work by hand and their housework by hand. First of all, uh, we, that's not the way uh, we evolve. We evolve moving all day long, as you alluded to our cavemen selves. Secondly, we think we're going to go to the gym. And if you look at it, we don't go to the gym. It's far less on average than once a week. So a bad strategy, good business. <laughs> I like that. And I would read that to India as well. We were a land of yoga, walking, trekking in the hills. And we didn't have gyms for the longest time. We also did a lot of manual work. We swept our own flows, we ground our own, you know, curry powders to get Smart. stone. But that's changed now. And we're the diabetic capital of the world. Like literally with just that, that activity moving out. And now we're flooded with gyms. We have gyms. We have everything across the country, but carbs has become the new enemy. Although people ate that diet 15 years ago and diabetes was unheard of. So I completely understand your point on constant physical movement. Today, it's one hour in the gym and it's sitting for the next, you know, 12 to 14 hours. And that doesn't cut it. Doesn't work. It doesn't make up for it. Yeah. Yeah. Dan, what about sleep? You know, can you tell me some of your findings in the blue zones about, you know, sleep patterns that they met? Is sleep very, very important for all of these communities? Well, not consciously. They just work all day long and then the sun goes down. And traditionally, there wasn't a heck of a lot to do. So they go to bed and they'd wake up. Um, often just before dawn and they do a little house cleaning and make the breakfast and usually go out while in the cool hours of the day. And then in the hot hours of the day, they typically come back and they take a nap. So napping was very common. Um, for centenarians, they report about eight hours of sleep a day. It's probably a, a good number to shoot for. And people who nap tend to have lower rates of cardiovascular disease, lower rates of depression, and of course, they're much sharper after taking that nap. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of upsides to getting in the habit of the 20 minute nap. Awesome. <clears throat> yeah. And the last pillar, which is emotional wellness. I know we spoke about purpose. We spoke about family. You know, today we believe that most diseases caused by stress and, you know, most of the enemies are within our own mind when it comes to health, physical, emotional. So your learnings on emotional health from the blue zones, from your own experience in life, what would you share with us? That there's no like cognitive behavioral therapy or, or the sort of type of, of uh, mental health hygiene that we have here in America. But in the blue zones, it's environmentally driven. Uh, a lot of uh, stress comes from be the feeling of being al alone. Uh, and nobody cares about you. In blue zones, you walk out your front door, you, you're in the street, you're running into people. You belong to a community that belongs to you. So you have that existential uh, sense of, of, of uh, connection. In all blue zones, they tend to belong to a faith-based community. So a lot of the things that we, and they can relinquish the stresses of the day to, a, to their definition of a higher, higher um, power. Uh, so they're not lonely. Uh, they're supported by their friends. They belong to their place and they belong to the religion. And I believe that takes care of probably half of the, um, uh, the, the, the mental disturbance that a people in the United States, for example, are dealing with. 
Okay, great. So Dan, this is also about you because your work is all over uh -huh. the world. But now, yeah, what do you do when life challenges you? I'm what kind of a big deal now, Luke. You know, I used to be pretty a non. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ron Burgundy, for those of you who know the reference. Um, <laughs> so the question is, what do I do? Yeah, what do you do to manage? You know, if you go through ups and downs in life, challenges. You know, what are your what are your mechanisms that helps you relax, makes you feel better? Well, I'm a big believer in in having a huge and and uh, nurtured social network, and uh, I have a lot of friends. It's different categories, but I have at least a dozen friends who, if I get uh, worked up about something, I can call them, and they'll care. Um, so when I'm going through a really tough time, I'm talking to those friends three or four hours a day, and they care. And you know why they care? It's because I care about them and if they call me. And I think that's one of the cheapest, best things you can do is, is find a – nurture a half a dozen relationships so you can call them on a bad day and they'll care. And that takes effort. That's not automatic. At least it's not in the United States. So I think that's one of the best things. I also live – like right now I'm looking – maybe you can kind of tell, but I'm looking at the ocean right now and palm trees and – I took a walk along the beach and these are all things that are good for our, our mental health and stress. And then I eat plant-based. I, I realized that the only argument for eating meat in our society today is because it tastes good. And I just as soon forego that taste for health and for a consciousness of what it does to other creatures, a consciousness of what it does to our environment. So I don't eat meat. It's a conscious choice and it's something that was reinforced and, uh, my time in the blue zone because people in blue zones, they might eat meat traditionally speaking, but it was, it was uh, an animal who had a good life, who had a name, uh, healthy, healthily and humanely raised. And then it was a celebratory time. And those people needed meat to survive. We don't need meat to survive here. We eat meat as recreation. Um, so I don't eat meat. Yeah. I, you know, I kind of, uh, there's this whole, uh, research that keeps going on grains are only a couple of thousand years old but i believe in the work that we do we look at cancer patients every single day and we see how the body has the ability to adapt it's constantly adapting it's constantly adapting to something new so you know when people talk about we have to eat only caveman style i mean we have so many new foods that humans have adapted to over the years and i think your research has put that out so beautifully that people are living to even over a hundred you know, by adapting to beans and everything else, even though probably beans didn't grow at the caveman time. And that's why I was- Luke, to... you have to realize that that during Paleolithic times, people were mostly hunters and, or mostly gatherers. They got most of their calories waking up in the morning and digging things up and picking things, tubers and, and seeds and nuts. Uh, on the occasion, they did have a kill, and the, you couldn't count on a kill. It wasn't like going to the grocery store. You get hungry, they're going to go out and kill a buffalo or something. Uh, kills were sporadic, and there was no refrigeration. So you had to eat it right there. You could go several days. So that there, I actually looked at Paleolithic cultures and what they ate, and it was far more carbohydrates, not simple carbohydrates, but carbohydrates than what we think it, think it was. Yeah. <clears throat> So Dan, uh, I think this has been amazing and you've inspired, <laughs> inspired so many people, you know, I mean, have, have you ever thought about your work, you know, becoming a curriculum? Like, I mean, if this needs to be taught in schools and I'll tell you my reason why social media is going to continue to have these extreme groups trying to pull down one another and somewhere research like this can get lost or it can be you know twisted it can be put in different ways and stuff like that i just wanted to ask you as an expert how do you think you know this problem of over you know so much of content out there and then solid research like this you know have you ever thought about how it could be fitted into curriculums or how people should maybe change the way they learn because what you've put over the last couple of years together is obviously a legacy and that can carry on for a long time have you thought about this well, thank you for saying that, Luke. I I know it's used in several schools already, but the, the core idea and the idea I hope 
people take away from this is that if you want to live longer or healthier, whether you're an individual or mayor of a city or the governor of a region, uh, it's you're never going to achieve it by trying to c- convince people uh, to change their behavior. Uh, because we live in an environment where you're never more than 10 steps from some packaged sugar sweetened beverage or candy bar or chips or burger or French fries or pizza or, or chicken wings. And, you know, it's impossible to tell people to eat healthy when 97 out of a hundred choices in the retail environment are bad choices. So the secret to longevity is not trying to change your behavior. It's not necessarily even educating people. You know, I'm, I'm here in America where 75% of us, Think about that. Three quarters of us are overweight or obese. We all know what we should be eating. Most of us know what we should be. We're educated, but we're in an environment where it's impossible to eat that way. And and until we wake wake up and realize that until we change the environment where we're making the healthy choice easy, affordable, delicious, enticing, we're not going to get the behavior change we want. And um, so that's that's the approach I'm hoping people take away. You did that. You, you kind of remodeled a city with all of your findings. And one year later, you presented the findings of, you know, the health score, the vitality score actually getting better. Do you have plans to make that into a model so people can kind of take it to different countries and change environments, like you rightly said, instead of changing people? Uh, yes, we actually do it in, we've done it now in 72 American cities. It, do, it takes five years, actually. But in in every city we work in, we see the obesity rate go down, life expectancy go up, healthcare costs go down, chronic disease goes down. And that's not because we come in and we try to convince a million people to eat their beans, but we convince city council to adopt uh, policies that favor health food over junk food and junk food marketing to favor the pedestrian over the motorist, to favor the non-smoker over the smoker. And then we work with all the restaurants, grocery stores, workplaces, schools, and churches in that community to adopt policies and design so people mindlessly move more and eat better and socialize more and live their purpose. And then we get a critical mass, maybe 10% of the population to become Blue Zones ambassadors. And when you have people places and policies all converging upon this idea where we're going to make the healthy choice, the easy choice comprehensively at the population level. Only then do we see people getting healthier. And it's worked in every city we worked in. It's a big lift. It's expensive, but it works. Okay. You think you're going to take that out of the U S to different countries, maybe at some point? Well, if we get invited, Okay. You know, we're we're pretty busy the way we are right now, but um, you know, we would we would we would do that. Okay. It takes a big commitment though. You know, we usually have for a city of a million people, we usually need a full time staff of thirty people working for five years. So it's um it's a challenge, but it's 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 the right work, it makes a difference, and uh, you know, you could take that money and spend it on gyms and fad diets, and then diabetes medicine. And I would argue that our approach produces a better outcome. Right. Oh, Dan, this has been great. And before before we let you go, I could go on talking to you for a very long time, but I'm mindful of your time. I wanted to ask Thank you. you, what's the message that you want to leave us all with? Like today, you've just gone, you had a walk on the beach, you have so much of research out there. We've spoken for a bit. What's that one message? If everyone was watching this right now, what's that one message from your life experience, your research, everything that you would love to leave us with? If you want to live longer, don't try to change your behavior, change your surroundings. So your unconscious decisions are better. Awesome. Dan, thank All right. you. it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And it's been a complete delight. I love you and we'll see you next time. <laughs> thank you. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Stay tuned for more. We're going to continue our journey learning, sharing, and evolving.